Uh, good morning and uh, particularly welcome to Core Finance today, um, Colin Hutchinson, who is the CEO of Ascent Resources. Uh, good morning, Colin. I've morning, been, Malcolm. I'm delighted to, to welcome you to the show. Uh, I've been chasing you for a long time for this interview, and I think now that a lot of ducks have fallen into a row, it's a good opportunity to, to get you to come in and tell us about um, Ascent Resources. So thank you very much for coming in. Thank you, welcome. Um, I always ask people to begin with if you could perhaps um, give the viewers an overview of what uh, Ascent is as a company, uh, how did you get here, you know, and how much time and money, uh, and probably you know why all this um, took so long to be an overnight success. <laughs> so, so a brief rundown. We'll get into the detail in a minute. Sure, uh, Ascent Resources PLC were an aim-listed European-focused oil and gas exploration production company. Uh, the main asset, the, the only asset at the minute, is the Petasovci field, which is in northeastern Slovenia, uh, on the border with Croatia and Hungary. Ascent's been in country for 10 years, um, shot 3D seismic, drilled two wells in 2011, and discovered there was a commercial volume of gas there. It's taken us some time to get the gas to market for uh, various reasons, mainly related to sort of Slovenian bureaucracy and one party in particular which has delayed the project and delayed us getting a route to market for the gas. We sort of unlocked things in a big way last year during the summer when we acquired a company which owned uh, access rights to a pipeline which ran into Croatia and we signed an agreement with INA, who are Croatia's largest oil and gas company, to sell them our gas untreated at the border. So that gives a route to market for the gas. We were able to raise money and fund the work programme that we needed. So over the last 12 to 18 months, we've recompleted the two wells. We've tied them into uh, an existing processing facility. We've refurbished that facility so it can cope with um, our, our gas. And we've also rehabilitated and permitted the um, pipeline which runs from our field in Slovenia to uh, Ines field in Croatia. And so it's, uh, <coughs> that's unlocked things and in the last Month, the beginning of this month, we started to sell gas to Croatia, uh, which makes us profitable and is, uh, generating cash. And then this week, earlier this week, we sort of had the long awaited news that our uh, permit has moved, it's got approved by the court, and we're on track now to get that uh, and build our own processing plant. Excellent. Right, well, what I'd like to do is to dig into a few of those things. So, sure. um, to begin with, um, you know, you've given us a good overview of the, of the field and everything else, but I'd like to have a little bit more detail uh, about what you've got, the number of wells that you're, you're working from at the moment to be able to produce what you are. And then I know you've got some work over wells. Have you got exploration wells? What, what's the detail of the, of, the, of the wells on the ground? And then clearly I'm going to ask you what, what your level of production is and what it could be. Yeah. I mean, at the minute we've got two wells. We've got PG-10 and PG-11A, which are the wells that were drilled in 2011. Uh, they've been recompleted and tied in over the last 12 months. Uh, PG-10, when we flow tested it in February, it flowed at eight, nearly 9 million cubic feet a day. Uh, PG-11A, when it was tested, flowed about 2, 2 and a bit uh, million cubic feet a day. We're producing, uh, at the sort of, we have a, a range of volumes that we can produce to ENA and we're producing sort of around 2 million, a little bit more than that, million cubic feet a day and there's scope to increase that. How we increase it, well, we increase it from the two existing wells and then there are a number of other uh, wells in the concession area and our field development plan uh, is to re-enter and uh, bring some of those wells into production. Uh, we're on PG 10 and 11 so there's, there's nine other PG wells and uh, a lot of those are in good locations, they're recompleted in the right sands but they were, re they were originally drilled back in the 70s and 80s when technology was a lot different and we think that by going back in and recompleting them in the way that we've done 10 and 11, we can get commercial volumes of gas from those wells also. The field development plan, once we've re-entered up to seven of those existing wells, the field development plan is then to re-enter, uh, as to start to drill in fill wells. And we've got uh, geoscientists uh, in Budapest and in the UK who have been reviewing the 3D seismic and are coming up with ideas <coughs> for where those well locations should be. So. The, the, the gas in place, there's, we had a, uh, an RPS report done in 2013 which assessed the sort of P50 gas in place at 456 uh, BCF. Uh, so there's a lot of gas there and we've got a sort of a 20 year field development plan to extract it in the most economic way possible. So we've got um, uh, seven more wells to, to, to work on, then the, um, the FDP would, would give you a lot more. So potentially, 
Um, and what I'm going to be coming to in a minute, obviously, is, is, is what you're producing to sell to Edna. But as a result of the IPPC thing, things could change a bit. So potentially you could sell significantly more. I, I know that you've got sort of production plans for the next 12 months because you're limited by the government, are you not, to a certain time, although you can probably stretch that a bit? We are. We, we signed a 12-month agreement with Edna, which has a sort of an upper and lower uh, production limit. Uh, we've started off at the the lower end of that while we sort of see how the wells perform and see how the reservoir behaves. Over the course of the next few months I hope to increase that so we get closer to the upper limit on that contract. It's not uh, set by government, it's more a commercial arrangement between ourselves and Ina. and the reason for the upper limit is they have to book capacity based on the upper limit so we didn't want to set it too high initially yeah. <coughs> but if we do want to um, increase it I think commercially they'd be interested to take as much gas as we can produce because the facilities we've refurbished and constructed could cope with uh, several times our initial production uh, and I think the, the capacity for ENA to process the gas is also significantly higher so uh, once we are comfortable with how the wells behave and how the reservoir behaves um, then there would be scope to increase production. So you'd increase production from the 10 and 11 8 wells. Mm. And what, what's the time scale in, in potentially drilling up or working over the, the seven more and then, and then the, the lots more after that in the, in the FTP? Yeah, so we've got the plans for the, for the next two wells and we're in the process of finally those, finalising those and submitting those to the government to get approval to re-enter those. So I'd hope um, really within the next, ideally by the end of next year, maybe early 2019, we're re-entering. Um, at least two more of those wells and then there'll be a plan where every year we do two or three wells and step production up from sort of two to three million <coughs> cubic feet a day that we're producing at the moment to eventually the field development plan has us at 35 million cubic feet a day which is a uh, once the well all right. the wells are operational. So, so during uh, 2018 you'll only be producing from 10 and 11 a albeit you might be having to produce a bit more yeah so it's the year after before you get into the <coughs> two of the seven and then two of the seven more. Is there any way that um, with further investment you could bring that forward and increase production and revenue before then? It's more of a, a, a permitting and a, an approvals uh, time scale. I think the funding, if we needed to find the funding for extra wells, we could do that. It's more getting the permissions from the Environment Agency to re-enter these wells, hopefully. And that that's the good thing about this announcement this week is we've gone through this preliminary screening process, which is essentially a faster way of doing things. You don't have to go through the full environmental impact assessment. So I'm hoping that we can use this preliminary screening process for the well re-entries as well, which should <coughs> significantly reduce right. the time scale. And the other thing in the announcement this week is our main objector has lost his special status. Yeah. So hopefully that speeds things along. Good. I'm, I think that's important now that we, we then turn to the, the, the judgment that was made, mm. the IPPC thing, because I think there are two or three things that, that people would want to know about that. First of all, as you said, that you, you won the case and therefore yeah, you, you can get moving on, on that, uh, and I'll come back to that in a second. And secondly, that the guy is now you know, uh, out of the, 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 the place, so you don't to get any more. So what, um, in terms of markets, and we'll come back to revenues from all the rest, Bits and pieces in a minute. What's the key thing about markets uh, in the uh, in the in the IPPC thing? Because as I understand it, you, you're as a result of this and the result of uh, building a gas treatment plant, you then attack a different market with the premium price of the gas that you're going to be able to sell to them. Yes, I mean that's hugely important. At the moment, we've got a, a pipeline which has a limited capacity, and we've, we're selling to one customer, and they've got a, a limited appetite, a bigger, reasonable appetite for the gas, but there is a, a ceiling there. What this judgment this week means is we can build our own processing plant in Slovenia uh, and put the gas into the Slovenian grid, which opens up uh, the whole European market, really, yeah. to sell the gas into, and really we can produce as much as we can and put it into the grid, so it takes the sort of upper limit off what we can produce. So it's it's hugely significant that the judgment um, and the, the fact that this individual or this organisation have been barred or taken off the okay, preferential so, list. Um, the key questions here are, how long is it going to take to build the gas plant? How much will it cost? And what's the difference between the pricing of the gas that you get now than you will then? So the, how long it takes, I think it probably takes around 12 months. We've got quite uh, well-advanced 
plans and we've already been speaking to vendors about yeah. the, the, the sort of plant we need. Um, so it probably takes around 12 months to get it uh, actually installed and up and running. Um, the cost of the plant somewhere in the region of 10 million euros, hopefully a bit less than that. 10 million euros would, you, would buy you the plant and the metering station which we need to construct at the entry point to the national grid. And then what that gives you in terms of pricing is probably a 40% uplift yeah. on the gas sales price because at the minute we're selling the gas untreated um, to the Croatians who have to spend money treating it before they can sell it. So we could sell out Central European gas sub prices. So um, on those numbers and, and time frame, um, I'll come back to how you're going to pay for it in a minute, but, mm. but <clears throat> if it takes about a year, would you imagine being able to sell gas at a higher price in, say, the middle of 2019? Yeah, that, that's probably fair. Sometime in the middle of 2019, uh, we'd have the plant up and running and be selling gas at a higher rate. And that rate. would be still be coming from 10 and 11A, but by then you might even have a, a couple of the work over wells to be able to add into it. Yes, yes. And yeah. tell me, as the amount of gas that you're producing, say you're sitting here in the middle of 2019, are you then going to be able to say... We're not going to sell any of the cheaper gas to INA and sell it all into the civilian and European gas transmission. Or are you going to be? Are you still committed for the longer term and you will produce the the the, the lower price gas to them as well as some of the higher price gas? Well, that's really why we signed up to a 12-month agreement with ENA because that that's yeah. a fixed term. Once we get come to the end of that term and we're in process of building our own plant, hopefully the pricing and the structure of the ENA agreement maybe changes a bit, uh, and we'll sell the gas wherever there's the best margin then. Excellent. Now, let's just do the, the how, how you're going to pay for the... Because um, mm. I'm going to come back to revenues in a, in a minute and so on. Um, it's 10 million euros, mm. um, which compared to the 45 million or whatever you've already put into yeah. the project, it isn't huge. But um, the balance sheet has what sort of cash and what sort of uh, debt and so on in it? So, the, uh, cash, we, we, we did a placing there not so long ago, uh, one and a half million, so we've got the, the bulk of that cash left in the bank. Um, we had to spend some, but obviously that was the reason for, for doing the placing, but we've got a good <laughs> chunk of that left. Um, and debt, we're, we're virtually debt free. I mean, the balance sheet has cleaned up dramatically yeah. over the last sort of two years. We did at one stage have 12 or 13 million pounds worth of uh, convertible debt sitting there and right. that has all bar Good. 50 thousand Good. pounds worth been washed through so the balance sheet's virtually debt free we're we've got a, a cash balance there and we're now going to be profitable in generating some cash yeah. in slovenia so the the plan for the plant is hopefully that that can be financed with debt yeah um, we'd had we had <coughs> a loan facility agreed with bmp paraba uh, several years ago for this purpose, for building the plant and for drilling two wells, which wasn't able to be used because of the permitting issue. Um, so I'd imagine that once we're producing and generating cash and we've got production history and we've got no debt on the balance sheet, that debt financing this yeah, plant, whether, be a it's, problem, yeah, yeah. whether it's a bank, whether it's vendor finance or whether it's another... Yeah, uh, I can understand that, other especially with nowadays with the more sophisticated ways of, of financing it. So what, what are the monthly revenues now that, now that you've settled down selling the gas to Ina? So monthly revenue, to, total revenue this month should be somewhere in the region of €300,000. And uh, the upper and lower limits on the contract, if we're producing somewhere in the middle of that for next year, should see revenues to us of around three hundred thousand euros. Right. So we we've got we've got seventy five percent of the project, but we get ninety percent of the revenues yeah. because we've put in forty five yeah. million. So uh, I'd expect and gas prices are, are higher in the winter than they are in the summer. Is they that are. Right? This is a good time to be selling <laughs> the gas. It's good to get started before the winter um, peak in uh, gas prices. So uh, yeah, the, the gas price should be higher right through till. Uh, February, March time when it starts to drip, uh, drop back a little bit. Excellent. So, so we, we, you know, you, you're, you're producing some decent revenues. You're going to finance the, uh, the, 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 the gas facility with debt probably, which is appropriate because you normally do equity for ex exploration and mm. debt for development and so on. So, uh, and so that through, the, through next year you should be um, continuing to build up the cash and, and, and the revenue. So, so what's the monthly burn? What's the GNA uh, asset? So GNA, we, we had taken the GNA down to a very low figure over the last because we've been uh, without revenue for a long time. Uh, that's obviously increased now that we're in production. We've had to hire staff and we've got ongoing operating costs. So I'd expect of that sort of three hundred thousand euros that we'll be uh, receiving in revenue and every month, we'll have uh, roughly half of that 
add yeah. into the bank balance. So the um, the processing costs are reasonable at the moment, and um, <coughs> our, our GNA. We've got a, a small office in Slovenia. We've got yeah. uh, sort of six people there. And in the UK, it's really just. Um, I'm glad you mentioned staff actually, because uh, in this whole process of getting to know you over the last few months and <coughs> so on, is that I got the impression that you were the only guy there. I mean, I know you've got some people on the ground, but you don't really have a, a presence in the UK, do you? And uh, so you're, you're. I mean, I'm quite impressed by that, that sort of burn rate because you're not. Um, yes, I mean we. Uh, I don't think you can be called a lifestyle company. Put it like no, that. No, we, we don't have <laughs> we don't have a, a nice office around Mayfair or anything like that. I mean, we, we we gave up the office in London some time ago when we were trying to reduce costs to a minimum uh, when the company was sort of struggling to survive before we signed the Unicom. <coughs> now there are we, we do have a board of directors here in the UK, and I've got. Yeah. Uh, uh, an administrator who sort of keeps everything together uh, yeah. without her. But you are the only executive director on the board, aren't you? I am the only executive yeah. director. We've got three non-execs who yeah. bring sort of, uh, a wealth of experience and, yeah. and keep me right with that. Yeah. And, and you're an accountant uh, and a sort of finance director in, in your own right, really, aren't you? Yes, and I started off as finance director and then uh, yeah. became CEO during when we were trying to uh, cut costs and, and, and rationalise Of course, Cameron and Davies, I know very well. Well, that's who I was going to mention. Cameron yeah. sort of brings a wealth of oil and gas experience yeah. to the board and keeps me right on the technical side. And then we've got Nigel Moore, yeah. who's a former Ernst & Young partner, who yeah. with a wealth of oil and gas experience as well, but particularly keeps me right on the numbers on the corporate governance. And then there's Clive Carver, who brings a yeah. wealth of city experience. Good. I know, okay. yeah, and I know him as Very well. experienced board. Yeah. So tell me, I want to do a quick word about the shareholder base, because um, when you look it up, it's got you know, a huge bunch of sort of Hargreaves, Lansdowne, and, and, and a few other bits and pieces. But it's primarily retail, yeah? you don't have a institutional base or a cornerstone investor or whatever? No, I mean, it's it's 100% retail, really, yeah. at the moment. Um, we, historically, Henderson, uh, became Lombard OJ, yeah. had a significant chunk of the company. It was really them that bankrolled us during the dark yeah. days when we were pre-revenue, pre-ENA contract. They have, uh, they, I think they were in 2012, they first came in, so they've exited over the last year and converted their, loan, their loans and sold out. So yeah. uh, it's we're left as a primarily retail driven company which is it's great in some ways. Um, well, it'd be great this evening when you sit down at 5.30 on the other end of the phone from hundreds of retail people asking you a lot of questions which uh, which isn't a bad thing, Must yeah, keep, no, keep you honest anyway. Well I mean, it's great, it's, we're very <coughs> enthusiastic and active retail shareholder base and we did, we did need to raise money then uh, a yeah. month or so ago we were able to raise money through primary bid by tapping into yeah, the retail shareholder saying, base yeah. very quickly so uh, it, it does give you the same access to funds, I think, that you would have if you've got a significant cornerstone investment. Yeah. So, uh, so before I go to the final bit, because the time is you know, shooting past, but I wanted to see what you had in the way of uh, ideas in terms of other growth. I mean, we've talked about the organic growth and, and, and within and keeping within one field and the gas production and the sales and so on. If you've got any ideas for you know, uh, moving to a different country or adding a different country or further assets in the same country or even... Uh, acquisitions. Well, yeah, we've got a lot of ideas and looking <laughs> at a lot of things. Um, I think there's a lot of room to grow within Petasobshi, within the project, as we've, we've talked about adding wells and, and bringing in extra revenues there. There's other things we could do in, in Slovenia as well. We, we know the country, we've got good partners and good relationships there. And then where we're located, sort of uh, on the borders with Croatia, Hungary, that, that sort of whole Central European uh, gas market, I think, is very strong. There's a lot of good assets in the Pannonian Basin. So I really, uh, the idea is over the next 12 months that we, we look, look out and look at assets in Croatia, Hungary, Romania, all, all, the whole way through Central and Eastern Europe to try and find some other, similar to what we have in uh, Slovenia, so with near-term production, can monetize the gas without uh, learn from the the, pro, yeah. the painful process we've been through in Slovenia. <laughs> and you, um, yeah, and you don't consider yourself to be a potential target. You're not prey for anyone. At the moment? Well, that's that's always a question <laughs> you get asked. And I mean, we are we've got a clean balance sheet. We've got an asset which is producing and generating cash. We're a London listed company, so people can can buy shares any time they Quite want. Right. So um, we've come to the end. I'm afraid nearly. I always ask. Uh, and my victims uh, to, to just give me a quick, you know, one minute thumbnail sketch of where you'd like to see a cent in, in, say, 12 months' time. You've pretty much outlined where you think you're going and how it all looks, but um, a, a quick sketch as to where you might like to see your, your, your shareholders might like to see you in a year's time. Yeah, I mean, ideally, where I'd like to be in a year's time is. Uh, producing more gas from 10 and 11, um, hopefully on the verge of adding uh, at least one, maybe two more wells, 
um, processing plant under construction and financed, hopefully with a, uh, a bank or a financial institution, and hopefully with at least one other asset uh, in the neighbourhood, uh, which is yeah. going to generate cash as well fairly soon. That sounds great. Uh, Colin Hutchinson is the CEO of Ascent Resources. Colin, it's been great to see you today. Thank you very much for coming by to Core Finance. Thank bye you now. very much, Malcolm. Bye-bye.